Today we're going to examine Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 50. I've titled this morning's message, Childlike Followers. Now, up until Peter acknowledged Jesus to be the Christ, Jesus's ministry was filled with miracles and admiring crowds, thousands of people gathered around him. But once Peter identified him as the Christ, Jesus's tone changed. He began to tell his disciples straight up that he must suffer, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and eventually he must be killed. He points out again and again that this wouldn't be the end, for in three days he'd rise again. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Jesus is now focused on preparing the disciples for what's coming next. That's exactly how today's text begins. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Friends, once again, <clears throat> they're trying to travel incognito. They want to avoid the massive crowds that always assemble when someone told folks Jesus was in town. Jesus needs to have some alone time with his disciples. He needs to prepare them for what lies ahead. You see, no matter how clearly he states what's about to happen, their preconceived ideas just won't let them see, wrap their minds around what he's trying to tell them. They're convinced that Jesus is about to start an earthly kingdom. Now they know that they're a part of his inner circle. So naturally they begin to dream about the positions they may be asked to fill, once the kingdom has been firmly established. They think that their private conversations have been hidden from Jesus. But the upcoming verse makes it very clear that this wasn't the case. Let's read Mark chapter uh, 9, verses 33 and 34. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. You'd think that by now they'd get it. They've been traveling with Jesus over two years. You can't hide things from Jesus. They didn't want to spin a yarn, so they just pleaded the fifth, so to speak. But Jesus knew. These men who should have been getting it by now, they still didn't have a clue. They're clinging to their preconceived messianic ideas, and Jesus knows it. They thought he was going to come in riding on a white horse with an army behind him. He was going to conquer their enemies and set up the nation of Israel to reign there forever and ever. You see, they've been arguing about who was going to be the greatest in that kingdom, that physical kingdom they anticipated. The most important kingdom asset to any leader would be his closest associates. And they knew that that could very well be their positions. So they were arguing back and forth about who would be the greatest when it comes to serving in this kingdom. Their idea of the kingdom of God and the reality of the coming kingdom, well, they were miles and miles apart. And Jesus is about to drive this fact home in the upcoming verses. He's going to make his expectations very clear. You see, he expects his disciples to be humble servants. Let's continue reading there in Mark chapter 9, verses 35 to 37. It says there, Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child, had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The word first there, did you see that? That word first tells us that Jesus knew they were arguing about who would be first, who would be greatest, who would have the greatest influence, honor, rank in this new kingdom that he was coming to establish. Or to put it in terms that my southern family would understand, they were wondering what the pecking order was going to be. Jesus is about to throw them a huge curve. He tells them that his view of greatness and their view of greatness are miles and miles apart. For Jesus... It's all about servanthood. Jesus is looking for followers who will act in the best interest of others. He's looking for followers who will manage the kingdom resources in a way that meets the needs of kingdom members. It's not about hoarding wealth or seeking recognition. This will be one of the last things Jesus illustrates for his disciples before they head to the Mount of Olives to await his surrender to the mobs. 
Jesus, the creator of the universe, the son of God, God come in the flesh, will humble himself, take a towel and a basin, and wash his disciples' feet. If the creator of the universe can get on his knees and wash his disciples' feet, then there's no reason we can't be servants as well. He wants to show them what true kingdom greatness looks like. This isn't at all what the disciples thought they'd signed up for. They thought they were going to be potentates in a glorious earthly kingdom. They thought they'd be showered with praise and oozing in power and prestige. They didn't understand this whole, I'm going to suffer, die, and be raised in three days thing. These guys are in for a rude awakening, and Jesus knows it. What Jesus needs, what Jesus expects, is for us to treat one another with love and respect. He takes a little child in his arms, and he makes his case. He tells them true discipleship, true servanthood, and tells welcoming everyone from the greatest to the very least into the kingdom of God. It requires loving everyone with the same kind of purity one loves a child with. Just as a child looks to us in complete trust, kingdom followers will look to them in complete trust. It's up to them to set the tone of the kingdom. The tone Jesus seeks isn't infighting. It isn't a struggle for power. He wants them to exhibit a deep love based in expediency. Now, I know expediency is a big word, but it simply means this. It's doing what's best for others in spite of what it might cost you. It's putting the needs of others before your own needs, wants, or desires. When you treat others in the kingdom with this kind of respect, Jesus says he sees it. He accepts it as if you're treating God himself in this manner. Wow, talk about putting a group of power-hungry disciples in their place. It must have made the disciples a tad bit uncomfortable. I can just imagine them squirming in their proverbial chairs. They do their best to deflect the words of Jesus. You know how you try to change the subject. You try to move on to something else because what's being said is uncomfortable. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 40 to see how they do it. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Friends, this is John, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James. Jesus has referred to them as the sons of thunder. You'll recall they were going along, a community rejected them, and they said, you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? Uh, they wanted to take action. This nickname was given to them because of their highly reactive personalities. When something happened, they wanted to react. <coughs> John doesn't disappoint. In spite of Jesus' words, <coughs> John still doesn't get it. He tells Jesus that someone who's not one of the twelve is out there casting out demons. Now note, he didn't say someone who doesn't follow you is out there casting out demons. He said someone who's not one of us is casting out demons. It's like he wants to keep all the power in the hands of those closest to Jesus. There must have been much more to John than this self-seeking power grabber that we see here. On a number of occasions, Peter, James, and John were selected by Jesus to go with them to to do things when other disciples were left behind. And yet these three seem to be constantly sticking their feet into their mouths. In this case, they'd taken it upon themselves to tell this miracle worker who was casting out demons to cease and desist because he wasn't one of the twelve. It seems that John felt that since Jesus had called the twelve, it was up to them to accomplish whatever work needed to be done in his name. Jesus' response must have really muddied the waters. He said, don't stop him. The fact is, no one can do this kind of work in my name and then just suddenly turn on me. Take comfort in the fact that whoever is not against us is on our side. The disciples drew a circle to keep these exorcists out. But Jesus redraws the circle to include them. The one who touched lepers, the one who ate with tax collectors, the one who ate with sinners and took little children in his arms draws a wide circle. And I am so glad that he does because we are all sinners in need of God's grace. The disciples will soon be reminded of this when they try to prevent a, a child from coming to Jesus. But that comes later. 
Unlike the scribes and Pharisees who've been against Jesus from the beginning, this miracle worker is not an enemy. I'm afraid that many preachers act like John today. We get very protective of our pulpits. We're afraid of what someone might say or do while we're gone or while they're filling in. Ministers can become a get they can become just a little bit dismissive of people in the pews. The ideas that they lay at our feet, we, we can simply rush them off. We can intentionally or unintentionally stifle ideas of those who seek to make the kingdom better. We see their expertise, and we know that sometimes we come up short in comparison. I mean, they know more about things than we do, and it's easy to try and cut them down to size. Rather than humbly accepting their help and admitting that they know more, some ministers seek to point out every flaw they have rather than praise their willingness to step up. Now, it can go both ways. People in the pews can become insistent on taking over the work assigned to the minister of a congregation as well. Christ calls us to put aside these kinds of petty jealousies. He wants us to labor together for the good of the kingdom. He wants all of us to use our gifts to the very best of our ability. While we must adhere to biblical absolutes, there needs to be a great deal of girth, a great deal of space given to those who seek to step up and make a kingdom difference. No matter how small the contribution, when given in love, it's recognized by God. And that's exactly what's made clear in Mark 9, 41. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. The gift that Jesus mentions is simple, a cup of cold water. It's something that almost anyone can give. And yet it's a gift that's essential to life. You can live weeks without food, but only days without water. The cup of water symbolizes any practical gift, food, clothing, shelter, financial aid, or even help getting out of a snowdrift. Whatever you do as part of Christ's kingdom, it is seen and will one day be rewarded by God himself. You don't have to fight for recognition. Look at me, I'm shoveling snow. No, that's not what you've got to do. You don't have to fight for recognition because Jesus sees it all. Let's take a moment to continue reading there in Mark 9, verses 42 to 48. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. Now, just a bit of housekeeping before we move on. If your Bible doesn't have verses 44 and 46, it's because these verses were not in most of the early manuscripts that are still extant, which means still in existence today. Don't let that throw you. They simply repeat what's said in verse 48, so the content's still there. In order to be true to the majority text, these verses have been left out of many of the newer translations. They both said the same thing, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So if you want you to say that three times, there the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There you've got it. Okay, with that out of the way. Let's take a look at these strange mutilation verses. In verse 42, he's speaking to those who could become an outside threat to those who are new in the faith. He now turns to the danger or the temptation that comes from within the believer. We've got to be careful when we examine these verses. We don't want folks to go away with the idea that they should run home and start whacking off body parts. I'm pretty sure that all of us at one time or another have done something with our hands that was just plain wrong. I'm guessing that all of us have allowed our, care, our feet to carry us into a place where we shouldn't have been from time to time. I'm guessing that all of us have ogled someone of the opposite sex with less than righteous eyes. That being the case, we should be running around blind with no hands and no feet if we took this passage literally. I don't believe this was Jesus' intent. If we're to bring this passage over into modern day lingo, it would come out something like this. Even if it costs you an arm and a leg to resist temptation, it's worth it. You don't want to end up in hell. When we talk like that, we aren't suggesting that a person whack off an arm or a leg. We're simply using colorful language to make the point that resisting temptation is very, very important. 
I think that that's exactly Jesus' point here in this text. Well, I don't think we should go around cutting off hands and feet and poking out eyeballs. I do think that we should take Jesus' words very seriously. We mustn't let temptation get the best of us. To overcome temptation, we may need to cut some things off, though. If we're a recovering alcoholic, we may need to never take another drink of alcohol as long as we live. If we're a recovering drug addict, we may need to cut off our old relationships that threaten to pull us back into the life of addiction. The rich young ruler, well, he needed to amputate his wallet, it seems. If you ever seen Fireproof, then you probably recall what he did to his computer. I loved it. The eyeballs of his neighbor as he beat that computer to death, they were, they were impactful. We need to get rid of things that stand between us and God. Probably not our hands, feet, or eyeballs, but the things in this life that would draw us away from Jesus. We need to take temptation seriously. If we don't, we'll find ourselves cooking in hell where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. Now, here's the really scary thing. This passage is written to and speaking to believers. He's telling believers, you've got to resist temptation or you're going to find yourself right back in the same mess you were in. The mess that you were in before you were granted God's amazing grace. Both the stumbling Christian and the Christian who causes others to stumble are subject to judgment. Let's go on and read Mark chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and, and be at peace with one another. <laughs> now, these verses, they don't seem to fit. <laughs> I was doing this as I was looking at those verses. <clears throat> I had a hard time wrapping my mind around it. It's hard to discern the intended fit. The best I could come up with is that both fire and salt purify. That being the case, Jesus was saying, we all need to be purified so that we can effectively live at peace with one another. In purity, we should encourage, uplift, and spur one another on toward the goal of eternal life. When viewed in this manner, this is a helpful word for the church today. We're living in an age where people are insisting on imposing their own agenda rather than working peaceably with others. They're promoting political correctness over biblical absolutes, over biblical truth. They're promoting current culture over God's will. People need their hearts purified. People need to realize that there's a huge penalty for promoting things that confuse those who are new in the faith. I preached at a church not too far from here where a Sunday school teacher was doing exactly that. He had read Jack Cottrell's book on grace. Now, it's a good book. I had Jack Cottrell in graduate school, a great teacher. I really enjoyed him, very capable. Uh, but as he read that book, he tried to feed things that were written for mature believers to the new believers class. You have to realize that this was a church of about 350. The new believers class was probably bigger than our whole congregation. These new believers were just coming to understand their relationship with Jesus. And they were being confused by him trying to teach these truths before they were ready for them. Folks in the class came to me and they told me that their Sunday school teacher was teaching them that they don't have to do anything that they're being taught to do. They don't have to be baptized. They don't have to give offerings. They don't have to attend church. They don't have to partake of communion. Now, I know what this guy was trying to get across. And it's a meaty truth that mature believers should grasp. It wasn't, however a truth to cram into the mouths of new believers. His point was, we should do these things not because we have to, but because we love God so much we want to. I get it. I understand. But new believers need to drink milk before they're ready for meat. He was choking them. You have to begin with the rules and let it grow into love. I tried to explain that this wasn't the proper thing to be teaching this group of young believers, but he wanted to prove how smart he was. We ended up removing him from his class for a while, and he ended up spending all of his time and effort making my life miserable. He even told me that he was blood and he'd outlast me. He was right. He did. And Christ's church suffered greatly as a result. One day, he'll, help, he'll be held accountable for trying to force feed meat to babes in Christ. You know, I was young, and I've grown a good bit in my tactics for handling these kinds of situations over the years. I was in my 20s then. I could have done better, but Jesus is pretty clear about how he feels when it comes to confusing those who are new to the faith. 
You have to begin where people are. I remember my son, we, we taught them from an early age that you don't put anything in the receptacles, that you stay away from them. But after one Christmas, he decided he was going to do something special and show us as his parents. He went and got some bobby pins and he went and stuck one bobby pin into each outlet around the entire kitchen. Fortunately for him and for us, he stuck those bobby pins in the ground hole. Whenever we came to us, he said, look, mom, look, dad, I made Christmas tree lights. Plug them in. Yeah, needless to say, we let him know that putting bobby pins inside receptacles was a really bad idea by whacking him on the backside so that he would know never to do it again. Now, we, we did that because we loved him. He didn't understand love. What he understood was if you put bobby pins in the receptacles, mom and dad are going to whack your backside. He's grown now. He's got children of his own, and I'm sure he's probably telling them, don't put things in the receptacles. He's doing it because he loves them. He's learned love, but it began with obedience. Are you doing anything that could be detrimental to those who are new in the faith? Are you choking them with meat before they're ready? If so, it needs to stop now. The fact is they need milk. The fact is we all need to become more like little children. They're sponges. They soak in all that we pour out. That's how we should be at the feet of Jesus. Wanting to soak it in, beginning where we are and growing to where we need to be. Childlike followers who love and obey the one who first loved us. That's what Jesus desires. Do you want to come like a child to the feet of Jesus? Are you ready to love him and to be loved by him? Are you ready to be like a sponge, ready to soak in all that God has to offer? Are you ready to admit that only Jesus can make your life complete? If so, now's the time to make that known as we stand and as we sing, only you.